Today's date is October 13th, 2004. We are at the Warhawk Air Museum in Nampa. Today we are interviewing Hiram Lorenzen Jr. as part of the Veterans History Project in association with the Library of Congress. Mr. Lorenzen, welcome. Uh, my name is Brandon Hall and I will be conducting the interview. Also pleasant in the room is Ali Hill, um, Dana Olin, and Chris Butler. Uh, Mr. Lorenzen, please give us your full name, your address, your birth date, and what branch of service you were in and when. My full name is Hiram A. Lorenzen. I'm at 225 Sunny Lane. My birth date is January 15, 1919. Uh, I was in the signal car, and I served uh, from before Pearl Harbor to um, five years later, I guess, in Europe. In Europe. So Hiram, you, you had mentioned to us that you had began um, in the Signal Corps prior to Pearl Harbor. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up? I was born in Alameda, California, and I went to the University of California as an electrical engineering student. I took ROTC for four years. On January 1st, uh, 1941, I became, January 15th, 1941, I passed into my 21st birthday after having four years at the college and they called me into the signal office and a colonel shook my hand and asked me if I wanted to be in the reserves. Did I accept my commission? And he shook my hand and he wouldn't let it go because in my other hand he gave me my orders to active duty and I couldn't even commit my, finish my finals. I ended up in, I think it was Hunter Liggett Military Reservation on, on maneuvers, and about three weeks later, I was shipped to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And there, there was a big line of, line of new recruits coming through the school. And a sergeant asked if I wanted to, uh, if I was interested in ultra high frequency techniques. And I said, yes, I was. So he diverted me into an office with another colonel who asked me if I wanted to learn about ultra-high frequency techniques and if I was willing to not go to the signal school but let them send me any place that they wanted to to do some work with other kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. He said, by the way, we, we can increase your salary to double a second lieutenant's pay, which was $125 a month and then send you any place in the world we want to. Next thing I knew, I was on a train going to Canada. As I went through New York, everybody was being very peaceful. We weren't in war. Uh, and there was newspaper articles said, hey, you know, in the North Atlantic, our Navy is being shot at by the Germans. Well, the U-boats. Well, we thought that was pretty terrible because we're not at the war, in the war yet. So I got on a boat with, there were 50 other boats, and we went, went off the Canadian coast about two miles, and the American Navy took over and convoyed us all the way across the pond for 24 days while the Germans tried to shoot the boats out from under us and the Navy dropped ash cans on the submarine. So I assumed we were in the war, but nobody knew it. Of course, our mission was to go into a radar school in Britain and learn about British radar, which was supposed to be operationally more advanced than our radar. So they trained us, very concentrated training, and then shipped us off, each one of us off to a different uh, the first group was 35 people, but eventually there were over 400 in the electronics training group, I think they called us. And since it was radar, it was secret, and that we were over there was secret, nobody knew it. But I was in full uniform. In the British anti-aircraft un unit, I was the only American. I had full control of their radar. They calibrated it, trained the operators. Um, I had a searchlight with a 
Yagi antenna on it and a barrage balloon to calibrate it. And uh, we were busily engaged in shooting down German planes that flew over two, three nights a week and dropped bombs. Mm -hmm. And there's all kind of stories about that. Mm -hmm. I died. When you got there, were you involved in a lot of the decoding and encryption? No. Any of that? No, just keeping the radar going. And they had uh, 125 rockets in this group that they plotted everything out on a table. And when it got to the right place, they would uh, let them all go, which filled a spherical mile of shrapnel. So the planes would take evasive action, uh, try and get out of the spherical mile. They were pretty effective because some planes were shot down that way. Of course, we could only fly uh, the, the rockets in a certain area so they, the, the casings wouldn't land back in the city. Mm -hmm. Car out of his, his official vehicle out of his garage, the, it was his, his driver got to him and said, sir, you'll be delayed a little bit this morning, there's been an accident. And so he went out to look at his car, and in the bonnet of the car, which is the hood, was one of the shell casings from his anti-aircraft rocket battery. <laughs> and we all heard about that. I bet. Don't fire in a dangerous section. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. So if, if that was in probably mid-1941, when you were over in England, what kind of stuff were you hearing about back home? Was it, were you aware of America? America's I couldn't tell my or parents or anybody else where I was. I couldn't write them letters. There wasn't anything I could do. They just knew I was in the Signal Corps, and the last they heard, I was in Fort Monmouth. Really? So they didn't even know you were outside the country? No. Um, later on, I was, as the Americans started to come over, then I was able to write to them. Uh, I met an English girl and I married her in the two years I was there. And just about the time we got married, we knew we were going to have a child. That was very complicated. <laughs> That's not in there. Because you couldn't let your parents know by then? or we. It ended up that they did get shipped to the United States before my travels got more complicated. So, so as the United States involvement continued to grow, were, what kind of information were you receiving while you were in your post about America's involvement? Were you aware pretty much of what <coughs> the British press was saying or were you, when, like by the time I guess Pearl Harbor happened, for example? Well, then we were belligerent. Before Pearl Harbor, I was not belligerent, but I was helping shoot down German, German planes. Um, there was very little said about, there was no publicity at all about, except that I was in uniform, no publicity at all about my being there. Mm -hmm. But the British was very, they paid me $80 a month, 80, 80 pounds a month. Uh, as their contribution to my being a, a radar officer. Um, so I was making lots of money and all of it was going home, I get most of it. So there wasn't any place to spend it. Fish and chips was the best meal you could get. Um, it, it was very Spartan, it was tough life. So when you talk about belligerence then, so when you found out, you and the, the guys you were with found out about the attack on Pearl Harbor, what was your initial reaction? You knew that the United States was now going to be increasing its involvement in the, the war? Mm -hmm. and um, since we were getting bombed two, three, four, four nights a week, it, Pearl Harbor was just another bombing someplace, you know? The Britons were, were taking a terrible pasting on that. Like there's a story about the, uh, the uh, husband and his wife and his kids used to go down into the bomb shoulders every night. And he got tired of that. So he decided one night that he was going to stay in his up upstairs apartment. And one of the bombs hit the apartment and eliminated him. Mm 
And his family thought that was pretty bad. They stayed with some neighbors who took them in immediately. And the next night, they all went down into the bomb shelter. The next night, the bomb hit the bomb shelter. So the whole family was eliminated in two days. And that must have put out a sense of worry and fear among not only the populace, but pretty much everybody. That feeling of the Everybody unknown. had a war mentality, yeah. Much different than what you'd left in New York. Yes. So once uh, the United States became involved, did they change your, what changed for you as far as your location? I, well, nothing changed until they all got over there, until an anti-aircraft outfit was sent over there. But they stripped the anti-aircraft outfit of all the people who were being trained on the SCR-268 gun-laying uh, radars and left them in the United States to be trained. They never rejoined the unit, so we had to chain, train who was left on how to use the units. But we couldn't do that in England because the radars were in the ships. So after marching around and, and getting physically capable uh, and doing maneuvers on the ground a little bit without any guns or radar, we got on the ship and took off for North Africa. So that, that I didn't even see the American radar till it landed in, in Oran, which is right there. Mm -hmm. So you started in Algeria? Uh, no, we started, we started from we, England, and we came around here, and we stopped in uh, um, the Gibraltar, where we uh, there was some Ger uh, Italian people, two guys on a little submarine thing like thing, but put a bomb on the bottom of the ship and we had to come and stand on the deck in our uniforms and our equipment and, and our life preservers waiting for the ship to blow up. <laughs> and then we took off from there and landed at Iran. We invaded Iran. Of course, uh, Rommel was over in here someplace. He was too busy fighting the, the British to do anything about our landing here. So it was fairly easy for us Against to the land Vici. and set up. Because we have the job now of training the people we had, the ones who were left over, and finding radar that I didn't know anything about. So I had a very smart um, master sergeant, and the two of us traced the circuitry in the radar. Each one of the boxes in the radar had a schematic and they burned it off with a, um, a blowtorch when it left New York because it was classified. The schematics were classified. So I had to write a book on how to maintain them, the radar. And we put it in something you probably have never seen before. It's a kind of a purplish material that you can put a piece of paper on and you can make carbon, a copy. Like a carbon sheet? It's kind of a gel that transfers the, the printed page in purple to a piece of paper. So I was able to reproduce it and we sent it to the other radar units that were in North Africa. Um, we then, after we'd been here for a while, there was all kind of fun things that happened. Um, there was one night when they said there was a possibility of a counterattack. And so the radars were all on looking, and we couldn't, our radar could see 25 miles. That's the time base. It goes out, it hits the target, and sends a signal back. So we're getting a lot of targets out there in the north in here. Some of them were moving. And we told, told the, uh, the Navy that we could see a bunch of targets out there, and they said there's nobody out there. We said, well, do we have permission to turn on a searchlight and locate one of the close ones? And they said, well, if you have to. So we turned on the searchlight and there's a destroyer out here, right off the coast. So we thought about that for a while. We turned the lights off because they didn't return any fire or do anything hostile. And then the Navy said, 
Well, there was a secret convoy out there that they didn't want to tell us about <laughs> with some dignitaries on it. What we were doing is we were able to, because of an anomaly, we were able to look over the curvature of the earth and pick up the mountains here in, in Spain mm -hmm. and get a signal back. See, it would oh, the, bounce it off that. But it would bend the signal and bend it coming back. And so we'd get, and the way we found that out is we'd take a radar here and a radar over there and cross check, run the plot on the table. We'd see, well, it, it, that same signal is right there, so it's in Spain. We're, so it was something anomaly we didn't know we could do. Wow. That was kind of interesting. And then we t took uh, the radars and we moved them very slowly up to Algiers. And we were there for a little while. Then we moved it up to a Bay of Bizerta, which is up in here someplace. Mm -hmm. And we took a landing craft and went over to Sicily, to Agrigento, and went across the island to Palermo. And we stayed there for quite a little while, while Patton was running up this shore here and the British were running up the other side and there was a real scramble to see who was going to get to <laughs> the Messina first. And before that happened, I was called back to the United States. And so they flew me from Sicily to Algiers and then from Algiers I got on another plane and flew, flew to Marrakesh, North Africa from North Africa to Natal, um, South America, then to British Guiana, then to Cuba, and from Cuba to Washington, D.C., and I went into the office of the chief signal officer where I was reassigned to a maintenance group in Bradley Beach, New Jersey. Hmm. And then a colonel and two other officers were assigned to go back to Rome to look for how we were doing with maintenance parts for radios, uh, radar, anything that was electronic. And we, we were forming a big uh, list of things that they needed that were good, bad, whatever. We had a good report we made. We, we got as far as Bologna, which is mm -hmm. right up in here someplace, yeah, yeah, right there. where we were doing a holding action on the Germans so they would keep their troops over here while the invasion took place over there. If, if we had pushed further, then these people would have withdrawn and joined this thing here to attack us over there. So as soon as that got going, we went, they flew me to Paris to pick up some more information about what the troops were experiencing over here and, and communication equipment. And that after a little time over there, I went back to Britain to go back to the United States. Now, I don't know how I got from Britain to back to the United States. I don't remember. A French family was living over there. It was a Monsieur Cormoray and his, his family. And he came out on his balcony one day and he said, uh, Roosevelt de Morte which was the first I knew that Roosevelt had died. And then he invited me to dinner. And I thought, well, you know, they've just been invaded. How can they have very much for dinner? But he so served me a before dinner drink. And then we sat down at a table. And four hours later, with all kinds of food, I stumbled down the stairway because it was a bottle of wine followed by cognac after dinner and I was drunk as a skunk and I went down and got in the lift which is an elevator went back to my apartment and kind of died for a couple of days it was a great great meal they had a young lady who the daughter who, who knew a little English and I knew a little French a little little my High school French paid off. <laughs> so, so by I the time, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say by the time then uh, Roosevelt would have died, what, what uh, your wife and child in Britain had went back to the United States? They'd already been, I didn't know that. So I got back to Britain to find out where they were, and they'd already left on a ship uh, a 
Queen Mary, I think, <laughs> had uh, taken them to the United States, and they were already in California. Wow. See, my son was three years old by then. <laughs> I had never seen him. No kidding. So it sounds like we passed through quite a bit of time. I was just not to back up too far, but when you came into Iran um, in Algeria and you said you invaded, wh who did you did you come up against the Vichy French, or was it an open beach basically? Nobody, absolutely nobody, no opposition whatsoever. And did the troops there, the French, merge in with kind of what you guys were doing, or never saw any French. Uh, the British were opposing uh, Rommel. Mm -hmm. And that's all I ever saw was the British and the Americans were totally controlling this north shore of of I'm Africa. Curious, yeah. Over to you. Okay. <laughs> um, so if we were up to the time of Roosevelt's death when you were in Paris then, I guess if we were to continue back with that, then wh where did you go after the end of, uh, after Paris? Did you continue heading east? Paris? After Paris. After Paris, I went to Britain. To find your and family had left. Yeah, and Britain. Then I went back to Bradley Beach and eventually was discharged in Bradley Beach to go back to, um, California. So w after there had been air supremacy gained and there was really no more shipping and whatnot, was there as much of a need for radar as there had been prior? Oh yes. Um, blossomed out at the time. They had the uh, higher frequency radars that were beginning to arrive and they were much better. We learned fast and we produced stuff fast. The aircraft was, how in the world they produce so many airplanes, it's unreal. There's a marvelous book called um, The Wild Blue Yonder or something to that effect that tells the story of a B-24 pilots. How old do you think you had to be to fly a B-24? <laughs> Four engine bomber. 19. 18. <laughs> they took 18-year-old gung-ho young men to fly these um, <laughs> coffins, flying coffins. All they were is aluminum. They pa packed bombs and enough gas, but no protection for the people inside. How would you like to be in the front of one of those <laughs> things looking at the flak coming up at you? Walk on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, they were really... American ingenuity is incredible. Um, fun story. Uh, over here in, in Spain, there were two German um, warships. The Ganai is now in the Scheinhurst or something like that. And they wanted, Germany wanted them back. But they didn't want to go out here because this is a pretty dangerous place for them to be. So they decided to take and put some anti-aircraft or some, um, what do you call them? Radar signals that would turn all the radars into just messes on their screens. And on a very foggy Scramble. day, those two ships went right up through the channel, right past us, and back to Britain. And they did it very successfully. We didn't know what was wrecking the radars. We didn't know what to do to fix it because they picked all the right frequencies and they blanked out all our screens. That was pretty clever. They got their two ships back. Quite a harrowing little journey through that narrow strait. There was another thing that happened. Since the planes were going from here to Liverpool and flying right over the border of, of Scotland and Britain. They were flying right over us all the time, and they liked to try and bomb us, the anti-aircraft that was giving them all the trouble. So there's a thing called a predictor, um, 
that sits on the ground. Everything was kind of voice controlled as far as setting the the, the shells um, to the right altitude and where they explode. And these girls were mounting a thing that was a telescope. One girl turned the handle that turned it this way and the other one turned, rotated up and down. And they were looking through their binoculars on each end and they saw this plane approaching. It was pretty low, maybe 300 feet. And they were told we couldn't fire at it, didn't have any markings unless it committed a hostile act. And as they're looking, they could see the bomb bays open. And then they could see bombs coming out of the bomb bays and they carefully kept turning the handles. It was during the daylight. And they could see four bombs come out of the bomb bay. And they, they were exploding out there until the last one came right straight down their view and they just kept turning their handles, tracking it right away. It landed right behind them right in the middle of where we were standing and made a hole that was about as, almost as big as this room here, feet across. Yeah. But it didn't go off <laughs> because it was of whatever in the fireism, it had been sabotaged in Germany by one of the workers, apparently. Oh, wow. Uh, I wouldn't be talking to you yeah. if it had gone off. And those two girls got some quite a commendation about being so cool, and sticking to their post while they could see a bomb at them. Was there a fear when it was in the hole that it might still go off after that? Oh yes, a special bomb group. The British were just amazing. They crawled down in the hole and disarmed the bomb. <laughs> just like that. So d during your times in Europe, do you have any other memories of the people or the liberation times well, the, that really the stand British out? Were, the British were great. I just have nothing but admiration for the people. Because mm -hmm. they put up with all this terrible bombing, 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 the buzz bombs that came over that were very crude. Um, they treated me fantastically. I drank a lot, bunch of warm beer. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm not much of a drinker. They had a big go wing a party for me. And I can remember walking around kind of gurgling with too much fluid in me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was one funny story. It was a funny story. Since they have a gun positioning officer who looks at the predictor, tells them where to set the fuses, and so that there were four guns, four or five anti aircraft. <laughs> and they'd set the things so they go off at a certain altitude. Because you're, you're carefully plotting on it. The radar and everything's giving you the information. Nighttime it's radar information. Daytime it's a combination. So, uh, a gun positioning officer then says, well, everything's tight, and he's looking at the predictor, he says, okay, fine. And then they can let the shells off and, and sh put the shrapnel up in the air. Well. One gun positioning officer had been off duty and was out drinking a lot of beer that night. He came out in his bathrobe and he's standing there near the guns and he's pretty excited because there's a bunch of flares being dropped. They're orange-like things that light up the whole area. And so we were firing at the sh at the at them out. Well, he was pretty excited and he started to to a gun crew that could hear him and then was pointed over here, the trees, shooting at a flare. The only trouble is it was the moon and they couldn't put it out. <laughs> Same color. Oh, England has a lot of fog. So if we turned on a searchlight, which had yacht antennas, four of them, we had a coincident beam, the light. So we go right up through the fog. We couldn't see what we were hitting, but we could illuminate the bottom of an aircraft. And the fighter planes just love that because here's a plane that's illuminated. It's dark every place else. And so they're sitting targets. They did everything to get out of that searchlight beam, which would follow them very quickly wherever they went. So it was a very efficient way of disturbing the bombing patterns. 
at least our local, a lot of them weren't at us. They were trying to go over to Liverpool where they could uh, drop their bombs over there. They weren't very efficient doing that either. Once everything kind of caught up with them and... Yeah. When did the bombing officially stop over there? For when air supremacy was officially gained, was it? Uh, the bombing stopped when we invaded. Uh, I don't know where they in they invaded someplace down in here. I don't know where they invaded, but they went across the channel the someplace. Omar, Normandy. That was pretty rough. But you've seen some pretty good movies on that one. Mm -hmm. Did you have any experiences dealing with any captured German soldiers at any time? Mm -mm. All I saw was, and I, I'll never forget the smell, smells and uh, horror. As we were going to be a Berserker, there was a whole bunch of tanks, German tanks of Rommel's army, and they'd been hit by flamethrowers. So the people inside were kind of cooked, mm. and that smell is awful. So I, that's permanently in my memory. That part of the stuff I didn't put in my memoirs yeah. very much. I don't think they made. Was there something in there? I don't know if there was. And that was in Algeria. Huh? That was in Alger, along in here someplace. And so your time in Sicily with Patton on the island, it must have been quite a hive of activity. Oh, Patton. We were, even when we were here, we were in full, in wool uniforms, with leggings, uh, with tin can on our head, tie, all off, we had ties. As the strap was buttoned under your chin, you were in full uniform and it was, 120 degrees and no shade except under a truck. <laughs> it was brutal. I can remember uh, waiting for the landing craft to get on it and we lined up and we went down this row and there were four corpsmen standing alongside there. We got two shots in each arm. So there were four shots we got before we got on the landing craft, and then we got a cup about that size or smaller paper uh, with um, uh, kind of a lemonade like in chlorinated water, which wasn't, it was better than the chlorinated water. <laughs> it wasn't cold. And that's what we got before we got on the landing craft. So did you make it to Messina in the end? No, I never got to Messina. That's when I was, I was taken off of Sicily and flown back to Algiers to go back to the Signal Corps office. All of, all of that European stuff took five years. But we thought that was just normal. Yeah. We didn't have to go home every six months. W was there a sense in among the guys and among the soldiers and whatever that progress was being made and that the battle was being put to the Germans? Oh yeah, we had we used to keep records of everything we could hear about the Russian going into Germany and the fact that uh, Patton had to slow down not to take and totally take Germany. You had to have the joint occupation of Germany. You know what that happened. It mm -hmm. created the, the created, wall. Yeah. And, because he could have gone in and taken all of Germany at the rate he was going. He did did you ever Patton. meet Patton or see him? Or come oh, in? I saw Patton, yeah. And his horse and his uh, fancy revolver. <laughs> the, the ivory handle bit. or whatever. He was really a gung-ho fe fella. Well, there's a question you could ask yourself. Do you save more men by going fast and expending men to go fast? Or going slow, do you lose more men that way? 
I haven't solved that problem. I think maybe going fast was good, but we lost a lot of men going fast. Mm -hmm. and that would mainly be across France? Well, or going, even down right, going, going across here was pretty, it wasn't, we weren't getting much opposition because it was Italian resistance. And they kind of disintegrated pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But going across here was terrible. So were there were there actually any Germans you guess confronted in Sicily or in Italy or was it mostly entirely Italian? We had uh, camps of we had camps of people in Sicily, mostly Italian prisoners. We got um, four. We went through the camp inquiring about do any people know about cooking, and. Uh, we picked up four kids who were much rather be with us at cooking and KP duty and stuff. And um, well, there's a good story about that too. We thought, gee, it'd be great if we could have some Italian spaghetti. <laughs> and they said, well, if you give us the flour, we'll make the spaghetti. And we got spaghetti sauce we can make too. The ladies make spaghetti sauce. Uh, most of the people near Fal that lived on the outskirts of Palermo Palermo, which was a kind of tourist place before the war, um, they lived in kind of mud houses, mud floor houses, and the animals were in and out. And outside they would stand up a board up against the building, and they'd put the tomato paste on the board so that dry it, it would dry out, so they could scrape it off and save it as a dried product. <clears throat> Trouble with that was there's a lot of flies. And so the dark spots in the sp spaghetti sauce was <laughs> dried flies. Um, but we didn't know about that until after we had a fabulous Italian spaghetti <laughs> feed. I just thought they were olives. Or <clears throat> Americans can almost eat almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> Especially a good meal like that, I'm sure. After yeah. Even. And the hot, it was cooked hot, hot, so it was all right. Eating flies must be okay. So had had a large portion of the Italian troops pushed back onto the main peninsula by that time? Yes. So was there a lot of cities that seemed full of women only? There was really not, the Italians weren't fighting very good. I don't think they were getting good, very good support in the way of uh, equipment or backup, you know, air support. Mm. We just controlled the air totally. Mm -hmm. Of course, we used airfields in Italy, and I think we had some airfields on one of these islands. I was thinking it was that one there, but I'm not sure. Where we were flying B the B-24s out over to Germany regularly. Can't remember the book too well, but the book is great. They have oh, it in the library familiar. here. Do they? Yes. I recommend it highly. It's great reading. There's a story of ingenuity. Well, one of the stories was in Sicily there's an airfield near Palermo and the, uh, the fields that are around there that grow produce would take the rocks out of the fields and pile them up on the side of the field, about as high as this room, eight to 10 feet tall. And at the end of the runway is a big pile of rock. So the smaller planes could make it okay, but a B-24 or a um, flying fortress uh, would take a look at that airfield and think twice before landing there because they practically have to put their wheels on top of the fence in order to, <laughs> the, wall, the rock wall. One plane came in, it was pretty shot up. Uh, it was a flying fort and it, the en all the engines weren't working properly and it was hitting and missing. And we were asked to light up the harbor out here off of Palermo so that it could land in the bay. It was quiet water. So the pilot just flew over the airport real close, real low down and said, I'm not gonna land there. And he went out and put the plane down in the water 
and we lit, lit the water up enough so that the, um, the uh, rescue boats could go out and save the crew, which they did, and the wind wounded, and they saved everybody before the plane sank. That was pretty mm. good flying. <laughs> the plane was really shot up. Wow. More ingenuity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just don't, those young guys, you just no way of stopping them. So from your time when you got in, what? how did your ranks change? It sounds like you advanced quite a bit in your knowledge of the radar uh, systems. and I slowly advanced to first lieutenant, and I ended up as a captain. And towards the end of the war, I became a major. Wow. So that was my rank when I retired from the service. So kind of to the end of when the combat ended for you, I know you, you talked about going back to Great Britain. There must have been a lot of anxiety to see your your son and your... Yeah, uh, yeah. I can remember him sitting next to me at a dinner party. He was a cocky little guy with a British accent. And I said, you better sit still and eat your, eat your dinner properly or I'll have to smack your bottom. He said, you caught, I'm sitting on it. <laughs> Cheeky. Yeah, he still is. <laughs> He's got a great gift of gab. So when you left Europe officially then and headed back to the States, uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about that journey, headed back to California to finally... Yeah, I can't really remember flying out of Britain. I was I had to stay there long enough to be able to get the catch a plane that was going in the right direction. Well, t flying out of Marrakesh, we were flying on a, on an empty plane, a four-engine plane, and I can't remember what kind it was, except there were bucket seats along the side, <laughs> and I took my air mattress and laid it out on the floor, and blew it up and went to sleep in the middle of the floor. The trouble is my ears started to hurt because it wasn't a pressurized plane. And I woke up and the mattress was hard as a table because as you go up higher, the pressure mm -hmm. in, in the air is getting really tight in that little air mattress. So I had to let the air out of the air mattress a little bit before it blew up. <laughs> and it would, it would have blown up if I hadn't that had- would have woke you up. Yeah. Sore ears. <laughs> I also can sleep in the back of a Jeep while it's going at uh, slow speed. I can also eat out of a, there were canned rations. Spaghetti was probably the best one. Um, you could put it on the manifold with some wire it on. You could take about two cans of spaghetti or what gonna eat. And put it on the when you hear the go, then you knew it was time to take it off before <laughs> it blew up. Time to eat. Well, we were going very slow, five miles an hour or so, probably maximum for all that stuff that was going across here. But I can sleep sitting up in the back of a Jeep. So, I babble on and on and on. No, a very interesting story. I'd, I'd like to hear maybe a little bit more too about after the war. We'll get to kind of that third After piece. After the war? So when you got back and officially, did you stay in the service? Well, being, no, I, I got in the reserves for a while until 1956, but they never really had much of anything to do in the reserves. So I ended up going to work for um, uh, International Totalizer Company, which was a group that was uh, working at dog tracks with an electronic, uh, take in the tickets, figure out the mutual, uh, what, how, how it was going, and so they could pay things off. We did that electronically, mechanical electronically. Kind of crude to today's stuff, but as the money came in, you could tell how much it was and which dog was getting the stuff, and they could change the odds. And Anyway, I worked for them for a couple of years, and then uh, I went to work for Lincoln Electric Company, which is a carrier telephone company, who were able to put 
three telephone calls on the same two wires. Fantastic. <laughs> Three telephone calls on the same wires. <laughs> I don't even need wires anymore. <laughs> and you think the amount of telephones that you can get into one wire now is incredible. But um, that was thought pretty good. And I was with them for about 10 years. I was a manager there for a while. Then I, <coughs> Lockheed was opening up in Sunnyvale, missiles mm -hmm. in space. So I worked on the Polaris Poseidon <coughs> missile systems, which were great missiles, much bigger than this table. The and Poseidon, we put ten of them, ten of them in a submarine. The first submarine was a Polaris submarine. We would put ten of them on it, and um, uh, it had warheads. We started out with one warhead, and then we put multiple warheads on them. I did that for about ten years, and then. I was in kind of a management position where I was reporting to the top managers once a week. Uh, if you have 11 levels of management, the guy at the bottom can say it could, wouldn't be, can't, couldn't be worse. But as you go up the chain of command, the boss gets the message that it couldn't be better because each manager will kind of soften the blow to the next guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you go far enough and twist things around enough, the bosses don't really get the story. So they had a group of us who would survey the, the chain of command and see what the problem really was and then report the truth without making the people down below too mad. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a fun job. I did that for a long time. I was with Lockheed about 26 and I returned, I got to be 65. My wife kind of liked that because I stopped working 14 hours a day, <laughs> never having a holiday. We always, the, the government always wanted the best and final results of the program, so we kept putting together um, different ways of charging for what we were doing. For a while we were doing cost plus fixed fee. Whatever it cost us, we did it, and we got a fixed fee to go with that. But then they got made us get down to nitty gun to keep the costs down. That was a very Opened expensive way to do things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, in the last part, I was working in outer space stuff, the satellites, mm -hmm. and I couldn't, that was secret too. I couldn't <laughs> talk about it. And when I left Lockheed, they said, we can't debrief you because you have it in your head, don't go behind an Iron Curtain country. Just don't even go. Don't even go to a Iron Curtain country. <laughs> Russia, to Moscow, Moscow on a visit, and you go into a hotel, you walk out of the hotel and some nice young man will come up to you and he'll hand you a manila envelope. And as you don't know what he's doing, so you go right, reach out and grab it, so and you're picked up by the KGB immediately and taken to have your head shrunk. Oh. <laughs> They'll get it out of you. Huh? They'll get it out of you. So um, I didn't go to any Russian in this place. Uh, but what we were doing is we were flying satellites with, I got into computers and if you take and listen to what's being said on radio and telephone, anything you can pick up, and you clue it on people's names and certain phrases. So the software looks at and picks out just the things that are most interesting to it, puts it on a tape recorder. As a satellite flies back over NSA, no such agency. No, it doesn't exist. Yeah. National Security Agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, we dump that to the ground, and if you've been reading the papers recently, they're kept picking information, and they have people who will um, trans. Mm -hmm. They have enough people to do the translation. They're, they're running behind, but it's a very efficient way of gathering. Mm -hmm. Especially popular satellite phones and internet and everything else, and certain keywords mm -hmm. are coined in on that. You know, when someone types in the word, you know, you know, something to that effect.
that would trigger red flag going mm -hmm. up. We're pretty good at that. <laughs> we just uh, haven't. They've, they've spent millions of dollars on translations. But they're, listen, look at all the languages you're fooling with. Mm -hmm. Especially if you get into like a posh tune slang or something, yeah, that not yeah. only using the yeah. derivative of the language, but some sort of... Even English is, can be... Yeah, far <laughs> different parts of the country, you know, different... In fact, go to a high school one of these days and listen to the language. <laughs> it's gotten a little simpler, hasn't it? Oh, some of it's pretty wild. <laughs> What's a blog? A blog? Yeah. You got me. <laughs> That's just the kids in their normal language. They have all kind of little short. I do. I do right now. I I uh, do algebra at a high, at the high school free. I have kids. Usually, I have handicapped kids. The other day, I had a young lady who was really good at math. A real rush. A real adrenaline rush when she came to pay me a visit. She is taking, she's taken Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, and she had to have, she thought she needed a sixth unit in trigonometry, and the school is not doing trigonometry. So she got a correspondence course, which is a college textbook, in trig, and there's some things in there that was kind of slowing her down. She needed somebody to kind of get her over the hump because the college book wasn't very exp explanatory. Mm -hmm. And she came, we did a couple of problems, and my brain finally was, let me think about those, and I was able to solve the factors, a couple of complicated problems. And so she was pleased, and so was I, because I've got a young lady who is really sharp at math. Not very many of those. I get some pretty tough kids, <laughs> but to be able to keep my brain active by doing that. Just doing trig. <laughs> Got to keep this thing going. That's great. So, um, what brought you to Boise? Ah, when my wife hired me at 65, she took me to where my mother-in-law lives. And everybody, what do you mean you live in, in a backward place like Emmett to be around your mother-in-law? They didn't know my mother. <laughs> Mother-in-law is a 94-year-old absolute prize. She's oh. a beautiful lady. And British? No, no. My, oh, I, I divorced after 13 years. Oh. See, my English bride and I lived with the only thing in common was the war. We were living on the edge of getting bombed. She was thinking about getting out of all of that and going to Hollywood. I mean, the other thing is, I was an officer in England. Officers are aristocrats. They make, they have all the money. So I must have had a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go to California. That's right near the. Yeah, that's, that's almost where Hollywood is. So <laughs> that was foremost in her mind. Mine was that I had a mother and father who got married and lived quietly, peacefully, lovingly all my life, so I thought that was what life was about. So I was in a different frame of mind totally than she was, and we didn't find that out for quite a while. So we, um, we did she, she stay in the States? She, she decided that she, she met somebody who was divorce situation where the, the husband w was living, former husband was living in Los Angeles, and the other people were living up on the peninsula in, uh, out of San Francisco, and she decided that the thing to do was to get rid of me and pick up with him, which didn't work at all. But anyway, um, she didn't want the house, the car, or the kids. By then I had a boy, too, uh, a girl too, a boy and a girl. The girl was five, the boy was 12. So I picked up the, I kept the kids. I really enjoy my kids. Um, uh, two years of worth of trying to pay off the debts, she ran up on my credit card. And she went on life with this guy, which wasn't very happy. Too bad. But it was a 
choice she made. She didn't see much of her kids. In later years when she was sick, her daughter became kind of like a mother to her to take care of her. So my daddy was great taking care of her mother as she died of cancer, which had to do with um, smoking too much and things like that. But and then after having been divorced for 20 some odd years, 25 years or so, I married the girl I'm with now. We've been married for over 25 years now. Uh -huh. So I, did, I tried it again. Picked up her three kids, <laughs> and my two and her three. Now you're an Emmett. I'm an Emmett. <laughs> and he's gonna cut it, she's gonna cut it off. Just yeah. about ready. <laughs> she's watching closely. Well, Hiram, uh, we missed. Is there, if, if there's anything else that's on your mind that you... Well, the only thing I can say is at 85, I finally found out I had spinal stenosis. That's my lumbar spine has three or four places where the vertebrae are pressing on the spinal cord. But I found that out as a result of having felt a, a chest pain and a little breathing problem. So having been an EMT for six years here in Emmett, I went to the local hospital. My wife drove me. The doctors took an EKG and blood test and said, you're about to have a massive heart attack. So she had my wife drive me to St. Luke's with some thought that if I didn't quite make it, she could use the cell phone to call for the EMTs if I had a heart attack on the way. On the way yeah. When I got there, my local cardiologist met me and did an angiogram. He said, you need a bypass. We can't put stents in because it's too, the heart is only having half of it with blood. There's a bundle block that prevents you from having full blood. Mm -hmm. So I was on a Friday. I went into intensive care and on Monday, a marvelous doctor, Dr. Forbes, put in four bypasses. I didn't have any pain. I was on Tylenol, there's only pain pills. Mm -hmm. No, he slit me yeah. right wow. up and he wired it all together nice and tight. I had no movement of that at all. No pain, no pain pills. And it's produced um, a total different life. The reason I can talk to you and I babble like I'm babbling is because uh, it's just a total different. It's like a new life almost. Uh. Total different life. I can sleep. My sleep is the best thing. I can sleep six to eight hours at will. I can take a nap anytime I like. My whole life, my hearing is better, my eyesight is better, the pressure in my eyeballs are better. Wow. Everything is better, except that my body's deteriorating pretty fast, and I go on the 29th, I'll have the spinal stenosis handled by a Dr. Zimmerman. So, that's where I am today. <laughs> Well, I definitely, and, and we at the Warhawk appreciate you coming in and spending some time with us and uh, giving your tell of, a very interesting tell of the Signal Corps, and I do thank you very much, and it's been great to meet you.